Welcome to episode 219 of The Brainy Business, Understanding the Psychology of Why People Buy. In today's episode, I am so excited to introduce you to Nancy Harhut, author of the new book, Using Behavioral Science in Marketing. Ready? Let's get started. You are listening to The Brainy Business Podcast where we dig into the psychology of why people buy and help you incorporate behavioral economics into your business, making it more brain friendly. Now here's your host, Melina Palmer. Hello, hello, everyone. My name is Melina Palmer, and I want to welcome you to the Brainy Business Podcast. Today, I am very excited to introduce you to Nancy Harhut, co-founder and chief creative officer of HBT. She loves getting people to take action and specializes in blending best of breed creative techniques with behavioral science to prompt response, whether that's online, offline, and or in person. She has spoken around the world, including numerous appearances at South by Southwest and has been named one of the 10 most fascinating people in B2B marketing, a social top 50 email marketing leader, and a top 40 digital strategist. Her article and work have appeared in AdMap, US Ad Review, Target Marketing, DM News, Graphis Magazine, B at B Magazine, Who's Mailing What, Copywriting Insider, and Open Me Now by H.G. Lewis. Prior to co-founding HBT Marketing, Nancy held senior creative management positions with Hill Holiday, Mullen, and Digitas. She's helped some of the world's biggest brands create successful campaigns. She and her teams have won over 200 awards for digital and direct marketing effectiveness for clients like AT&T, H&R Block, the GM Card, Dish Networks, and Nationwide. And today we get to talk about her first book, Using Behavioral Science and Marketing, which just came out this week here in the U.S., Within our conversation, we talk about a lot of concepts which have their own past episodes of The Brainy Business, but no need for you to take notes because I've already done that for you. There are links for you in the show notes, which are waiting for you within the app you're listening to and at thebrainybusiness.com slash 219. Those already on The Brainy Business list got a direct link from me in the email you receive every Friday. Not on the list yet. Simply sign up for any freebie at thebrainybusiness.com and you'll be automatically added. The freebie for this episode is the first chapter of my award-winning book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You. And if you already have the book, in which case, thank you, you'll also be automatically added to the list when you get your copy of the free PDF companion workbook. Both are housed in our free behavioral economics community called the Be Thoughtful Revolution. There's a link to join that global community in those show notes as well. Now let's jump right in. Nancy Harhut, welcome to the Brainy Business Podcast. Thank you so much, Melina. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, yes. So, so excited to have you with us as you and I were kind of uh, chatting about in this pre-call as is often the case with guests that I am honored to have on the show. We feel like I know you so well because we've had lots of little chats on LinkedIn or wherever else. And then, um, and I think, I believe you uh, were in the audience for a talk I was giving for a, a university in South Africa, even. I was like, hey, are you in South Africa? But <laughs> maybe that uh, was just more that you saw I was talking about that I was doing it and you showed up, which was super cool. Uh, so this, but this is the first time we're actually seeing each other and speaking, which is always fun. Yes, it is. And I'm very psyched. I mean, I'd love to follow you all over the world listening, but it's great to actually be able to speak to you now too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, for everyone who is just meeting you here for the first time, can you share a little bit about your background, who you are, and how you found yourself in this amazing world of behavioral science? Absolutely, sure. So um, again, my name is Nancy Harhead. I'm the co-founder and chief creative officer of HBT Marketing. And HBT stands for Human Behavior Triggers. And we named the company HBT Marketing because what we specialize in is um, taking marketing best practices and adding to them behavioral science so that um, our clients have the advantage or the double advantage of having best practices and behavioral science deployed for them, which just makes it more likely that their customers and prospects will do what they want them to do. Yeah. And so how long ago did you found HBT marketing? 
It's about five and a half years ago. Well, prior to that, I was in the agency world, but working for other other agencies, Hill Holiday, Mullen, Digitas. And as far as your interest in behavioral sciences and factoring that in, I believe you've done some research and projects and things uh, that has incorporated that. Can you talk a little bit about that background and how, how you found the behavioral sciences at all? Sure, sure. So I could probably trace it back to reading um, Robert Cialdini's book, uh, Influence uh, uh, the Science of, or the Psychology of Persuasion, which was phenomenal. And I, I suspect um, a lot of people who got interested in behavioral science might have done it that way. But uh, you know, I, I read that and I was like, oh my gosh, this is so applicable to marketing. But, you know, If you think about it in marketing, we're trying to get people to behave a certain way, get them to take a particular action. And behavioral science is all about how people decide to do things, why they do what they do. And I uh, just began to read, you know, anything I could get my hands on, uh, Dan Ariely and Cialdini and Sunstein and Thaler, you know, really anything. And just start to extract pieces uh, of research and, and principles that I thought would apply very handily to marketing. And uh, then I began to, to try to actually use them. So, all right, let's see what will happen if we we've test this out and test that out. And things began to work, which was great. And then clients were asking for more and more of it. And uh, the next thing you know, it just kind of, um, you know, took off in that direction. And I went from being a a marketer to being a behavioral science marketer. Right. And I mean, really finding that pretty early on in, like I even said, from my own book and everything, the first one, what your customer wants and can't tell you. When I was doing my master's and looking around, they're just wasn't much in that behavioral science marketing. And I would say even still today, there there aren't very many of us that <laughs> do work in that space. So one of the questions I know I get a lot is for, and I'm sure, and it's from listeners of the show that look at these types of journeys and then say, oh, I, I wish I could do something like that. Uh, so when there is someone who was first in a lot of ways, um, I always like to ask, you know, what gave you the confidence to do that? And what advice do you have for someone else who wants to do something similar? I love marketing. Um, I, you know, I grew up as a copywriter, became a, a creative director and, you know, ultimately now co-founded my, my own boutique agency, but kind of, I grew up in marketing and I absolutely love it. And anything I could find that, you know, might give my clients an advantage, give them an extra edge was something that I wanted to explore. And this just made so much sense to me. So when I started to, you know, try some of these um, principles and they began to work, I thought, you know, why not? Why not, you know, keep keep running with it? I had one client, um, they sold, uh, get ready for this, it's going to be really exciting. They sold insurance to dentist. So we got a double whammy there. We're going to talk about insurance. We're going to talk about dentists, but they sold insurance to dentist. And if you've ever tried to sell life insurance to somebody, it's hard, right? It is not an easy thing to do. And if you can convince someone to buy insurance once, that is a major achievement. And what they do is they check it off their list and they have no interest in ever revisiting that idea, right? It's like, I bought it, I'm done. Don't even want to think about it again. And this particular insurance company knew that every few years, you really should reevaluate your insurance because things change, your, your practice grows, you, you know, your family grows, whatever. Right? And, and you really should, um, you should really kind of reevaluate things, but it was next to impossible to get the dentist to reevaluate. You know, they, they bought once that was huge. They just shut down, uh, you know, anytime the, the company approached them again and you know, the company would, would have the statistics and they would have all the reasons, but people didn't want to hear it. And I had read, um, in Cialdini's book about the magnetic middle. And I thought, you know, I think we can use this. So we sent a message out to the dentist and we're saying, um, you know, it's a good time for you to reconsider buying more insurance. And we put a chart in and, and it on the left end of the chart was $0, which is the least amount of insurance you could have. And on the far right was 3 million, which was the most that the company sold. And we showed people where they were and it was always left of center. And we didn't expect that people would see that and go, oh my gosh, I've got to go buy $3 million of insurance. I've got to you know increase my policy to 3 million. But we did think that what would happen is when people found themselves left of center, they would want to move closer to the center. And that's the whole idea of the pull of the magnetic middle. It just, you know, it, it feels safer there. You don't necessarily want to be out on the bleeding edge, but you don't want to be left behind. You know, let's move towards the center. And so we we dropped that in to our messaging and we got like a triple digit lift. The client 
still talks about it. And this was years ago that we did it. And I was just chatting with her. She's in a different company now. And um, I'm still working with her, but, it, you know, in a different context. And she just recently brought it up. But, uh, it, you know, it, it's amazing when you, you know, you see these things and you start to try them out and they work. You just want to keep doing it. And clients, when they get a taste of it, are like, yeah, I, I want some more of that. You know, in fact, um, you know, a lot of clients would say, like, forget about testing, you know, the original in this. Let's just put it all in this. And, you know, which is great and flattering. But as you say in your own book, not the thing to do, you know, let's test so that we really know what's working and what doesn't, you know, doesn't work and, um, and, you know, what the, what the lifts are, but you start to use this and, uh, and when it works, that, that gives you the confidence to, to try it again, to try other things, to keep branching out and, you know, will everything work? No. Is there a silver bullet? No, but the incremental gains that you get when something does work are well worth it. And it makes perfect sense to, you know, to build on the marketing best practices by adding the behavioral science. Yeah, absolutely. And, what I love about that example, and really, I would say all of the examples in the book, uh, your book, which is using behavioral science in marketing, very tangible title for what we're you know here to do, right? Applicable title for an applicable book. I like that your examples are very tangible, very clear, very easy, and just a small little thing. And being able to note something like that left of center. I like how thorough and thoughtful the examples are, you know, so it's showing that you went through a lot of analysis and figuring out, okay, what is it that we're trying to do? What do we want someone to do? What are they doing now? What are the tools at our disposal? How might we incorporate various principles? And like you said, testing, so you're able to show it had a lift of, X percent or whatever it is when you don't know and you just think, I bet that worked. That seemed anecdotally like more calls than we usually get. You don't know if there was something else that made it so everybody, you know, called in this time versus another time. So it, it definitely is useful and people, you can visualize that left of center, right? You get what we're talking about there. So I'm definitely linking to my interview with Robert Cialdini in the show notes so people can learn a little bit about that. You also mentioned Dan Ariely, so that'll be in there as well as uh, I don't have something specifically on the magnetic middle at least yet, but the closest sort of concept there I would say is like relativity, right? Being able to see kind of where we are contextually. And what I think is really interesting about that is typically... I would pair something like that, that relativity with a uh, herding and a social proof. And I think a lot of people would look for that, right? Where it would say, you are like, most people are here, you are here. And so you want to make a move. But like you said, going from the zero, the 3 million, it's not saying that, you know, this is where you rank, like most people have 3 million and you only have 500,000 or whatever it is, right? It just is an interesting approach that doesn't, it feels like it's got a little bit of that hurting social proof, even though you're not comparing it to another human person or the the bulk of other people and what they're doing. Though you could have, if this person was considerably below and more people like them are here, that's definitely an extra little nudge to make them want to jump. Have you tested anything like that over the years either? Yeah. Yeah. No, because you're, you're absolutely right. Like if, if most people had what we thought was too little insurance, then the idea of social proof wouldn't quite get there. But this magnetic middle, or I, I guess there's another phrase called the Goldilocks principle, you yes. know, mm -hmm. it's so very similar. So that seemed to work. But with um, social proof, that is, that is incredibly powerful. We had one client that was selling um, voluntary benefits. So we're back to insurance again, but, uh, but voluntary benefits are, you know, you go to work and they give you your, you know, your certain package of benefits, but then you could buy more, you can buy more insurance, you can buy cancer insurance or accidental death and disability or, or whatever it is, but that comes out of your own paycheck. And that is the crux of the pro Well, that's one of the cruxes of the problem. You know, one is, you know, like, do I even need these insurances? And then the other is it, it feels like, um, your paycheck gets reduced because typically the company will take the, you know, the monthly payment out of your paycheck. So even though you're purchasing the insurance, um, it feels like your paycheck just got reduced. So it's hard a lot of times to convince people that they should be, you know, buying one of these voluntary insurance policies. And uh, one of my clients came to us and said, look, we, we know we want to use behavioral science. We know there's got to be a way to, um, to get people to, uh, to where we want them to, which is to consider these very, you know, 
appropriate and valuable policies for them. So we used behavioral science. We sent um, both emails and direct mail, and we tapped into social proof. We said something like, you know, um, Melina, uh, women like you in their 30s who are um, working, you know, who have successful careers in marketing um, and are making a good living – protect themselves and their families with, you know, these two kinds of insurance. And we slotted in the, the right ones for that profile. And the campaign did very well. I think we had a, a 19% increase in participation, which is, you know, people actually purchasing a policy. And um, the the increase in the average premium for policy was a 16% lift. So social proof really works because if, if you you know, don't really know, like, do I need this? Or what do people like me do? Or, you know, seeing something like that, where it was so specific, and you know, it was the person's name and their age and their industry, and the idea that they were working hard to, you know, to earn a good living, you're like, yeah, that's, that's me. I'm, I'm like those people. So if they buy this, perhaps I should consider it too. So social proof can be incredibly powerful. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So in your new book, you have broken it into chapters that are categorizing kind of by concept, which is a a layout after my own heart, because of course, uh, my book does something similar. Uh, Can you talk a little bit about why you wrote the book? And then we'll get into some of the details and examples and things that are in there. Sure, sure. Um, well, so the, the short answer is, honestly, Kogan Page approached me. They uh, saw that I was speaking at South by Southwest. They saw the topic I was speaking on, which was behavioral science. And um, they said, would you like to write a book? And that's kind of hard to say no to. But the, I think the longer answer is um, I do a lot of speaking at you know marketing conferences, industry conferences. And for the last, I don't know, five or six years, people would say to me, you know, do you have a book? I want to buy your book. You know, when, you know, when you're writing a book, clients would say the same thing. And, you know, the first one or two people that say something, you kind of go, ah, oh, that's really sweet. But, you know, um, but several people, you know, more than several people start to ask. And I began to realize behavioral science and marketing works, right? It, it absolutely works. And people, you know, who go to conferences, they can hear me talk about it. People who become my clients can also benefit from it. But if you write a book, so many more people can benefit from it. And if I start to detail, you know, very specifically, here's, Here's the principle. Here's a little bit of the science behind it, just enough so that you, you get it without, you know, having to have a science degree. And then here are some very practical ways to apply it. Here are some case studies where it's already been done. Here's, here are my examples of ways you might want to consider using it. Um, you know, here are even some personal anecdotes of how this principle manifests itself outside of business. For example, it would just, you know, it would be a very accessible, be a very accessible, very hands on kind of a handbook for anyone who might want to benefit from injecting some behavioral science into their, uh, into their marketing. So it just seemed like, um, everything converged. I was suddenly at a point where I decided I really do have something to say something that people could really benefit from. And then Kogan Page over in the UK reached out to me and, um, well, you know what a British accent can do to someone, right? I was like, <laughs> sure. <laughs> so there we are. Awesome. And yeah, that is definitely, there are lots of people that want to write books and then go, how do I even find a publisher? It's not, it is not a super common path to have the publisher find you. So bravo. It, I think it's a testament to the work that you are doing that you know, spoke for itself in a way that people wanted more. So congratulations on that. And I, I really do, you know, I appreciate that you had had reached out to me and asked about an endorsement, which of course I was happy to provide. And it just, it flows in such a way. I love the short chapters. I, I enjoy reading like Dan Brown because of that, right? Which is sort of the thing everybody says, but it gives you just, just what you need to get a little bit and then keep go, you know, learn the next thing and you feel like you can, you get some confidence uh, with what you can go and apply uh, from there. So with your book, was there, uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about the, the request and the need that you saw, but was there a specific gap you were looking to fill in the way that you structured the book? Is there a, a, something where you said, well, you know, I really want my book to do this thing that other books aren't really doing, whether in behavioral sciences or marketing or a combination that you really think that yours fills? Yeah, I, I what I wanted to do was really create something that was going to be, you know, short on science and long, if you will, on applicability. Um, marketers are, are busy and they're always, you know, looking at that next deadline and trying to, to kind of hit it. And they don't have the time to 
read all the research out there to, to dive into, you know, a topic that might be interesting to them, like behavioral science that, you know, marketers are, are juggling so many different things that they literally, you know, they, they don't have the time to do this. And I thought if I could put together a book that really was very practical, very actionable, uh, easy, easy to read, easy to get through, um, but easy to apply, that would actually fill a gap because it's hard to stay on top of all the research. And then even if you have the time to do it, it's hard to then step back and think about, okay, now what does that mean and how might that be applied? And I thought I was kind of in a unique position in that I've spent years working in agencies, working for different clients, AT&T, American Express, Seagram's, United Healthcare, you know, like a range of different clients, big and small. So I've got the agency perspective, the marketing perspective, and I just happen to have this passion for behavioral science. So I enjoy on my, you know, sitting on the beach, reading these books, you know, and or flying on airplanes, reading these books. I enjoy you know, digesting the material and consuming the content. And for me, it was fun to, to read it and to start to uh, draw the links between, gee, that study or that principle and what, you know, my clients are trying to accomplish and some of the challenges that they're facing and how, you know, how the two could intersect, how the behavioral science could intersect with the, the client challenge and, and possibly solve it. So God, if, if I write a book from that perspective, uh, there are very few others out there like that. And uh, it could be very beneficial for people. Yeah, for sure. And when you chose the concepts to include and the order to put them in, was there a specific intentional flow to that uh, as far as, you know, the path you think sh people should take? Is there always, I, you know, loss aversion comes up at the beginning for you here. Was that just you know, an easy one to start with and it just sort of happened or, you know, how'd that come together? Yeah. I, well, I, you know, I started, I think my very first chapter was um, the idea of, of emotional and, and rational thinking and how most people make decisions for emotional reasons and then they justify them later with rational reasons. So I thought I'm going to start there because that's a, you know, a, a good foundational um, chapter. And then from there, I started to talk about some of the other behavioral science principles that one could argue are um, pretty strongly linked to to emotion, you know, loss aversion, you know, that, that feeling of loss, social proof, the feeling of confidence that you get when other people are doing something similar to your, to what you're going to do, or, um, you know, reciprocity, the, um, the guilt that you feel if someone does something for you and you don't return the favor. So, so that provided a nice springboard. I figured I'd, I'd start with a very basic emotional, rational thing, then dig into some of the emotions. And, um, and then from there, I just tried to add on things that I, you know, thought made sense or, or were like logical next steps as, as people had that foundation. But I also, you know, mentioned in the book that people are free to, to jump in and out of any chapter that they want. They don't, you know, uh, I was talking about choice architecture and I said, my choice architecture was to, to set these chapters up this way. And I think, you know, it makes sense. I did it for a reason. However, I'm totally aware of the fact that not everyone is going to read the chapters as I've written them. You can parachute in and out as you please. And that's fine too. I set it up the way I thought it, it would make the most sense. But if someone had a particular interest in something or in a couple of different things, they could go in and out and, you know, read any chapter almost as a, a standalone. And I do reference in, in particular chapters, as you do in yours, throwbacks to other, you know, other chapters. Um, and I will say I reserved reading your book until I finished writing mine. Uh, so <laughs> it's like I wanted to, I wanted to buy it and read it. Like I got, it, I got too much on my plate. I've got to get this written first. So I'm saying, oh, like you do, like you do. I don't want you to think I stole your idea. I didn't. Oh, no. <laughs> but. I appreciate it. We both came to it, the same conclusion yeah. that it'd be easier for people to read that way, I think. Yes. No, I appreciate that. And uh, all is well right there. It's more good books in the world is, is always a positive thing. But people will ask me all the time. This is a little behind the scenes secret thing that not everybody knows. But I very intentionally don't listen to a lot of podcasts and particularly podcasts that are on behavioral science and applying it or, or whatnot, because I have an audience that likes hearing me talk, right? And if I listen to everyone else, then you get like, ooh, that's a good idea. Or, oh, I bet people must want this format, this whatever. And I don't want that shiny object of feeling like I have to be like the hidden brain or like the Freakonomics podcast or uh, anyone else uh, because people listen to them for those reasons and people listen to me for this reason and, you know, we're all good. So I appreciate 
all of uh, of what you're saying there <laughs> for for sure. Uh, well, I, I think I speak for uh, not only myself, but many many, if not all, of the listeners saying we appreciate you. Oh, thank you. That's very very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. So as we jump in to some of the content, what I what I would love is uh, say, do you have a favorite concept and or story? You you know you shared some good stuff from that insurance space already. But if you were going to teach the listeners one thing, you know, something that you think really resonates and is valuable, what would your choice be? So one of the one of the concepts that I didn't discover until relatively recently was the idea of autonomy bias. And uh, it's not that it hasn't been out there. It just didn't quite make it into my little, you know, sphere of, of reading and research. And the idea of autonomy bias is, is this idea that, you know, we're all kind of uh, born with this innate desire to have some control over ourselves or our environment. Um, you know, scientists maybe call it agency, although I come from marketing and agency means something else. It's who <laughs> employs me. But, um, but you know, this idea of having some agency, some control over yourself and your environment, and it's a very deep-seated need. And closely related to that is the idea of choice, because if you have a choice, that means you have some kind of control. You have some, you know, some kind of agency. And uh, so as I started to read more and more about that, I came upon two studies that I thought were really interesting. One was out of Tulane University, and they found that if you present somebody with uh, a couple of options as opposed to just one thing, you know, whether it's a proposal, whether it's uh, two levels of service, whether it's two different products, if you if you give them a choice, they're much more likely to make a buying decision in the moment than if they only have one thing in front of them. Because, you know, think about it, you have one option and you think, oh, okay, yeah, well, you know, it's out of context. I don't have anything to compare it to. So I'll, I'll sleep on it or I'll do a little research or I'll, I'll ask my friends or I'll ask my spouse, whatever it is. The question is really, do I or do I not want to buy this now? But if there were two options, the question just automatically transforms to which of these two do I want? You know, you have context, you have something to compare it to. And I thought that is phenomenal. And that can be so, so helpful for marketers. And then the other thing that I found was, um, a researcher named Chris Carpenter did a deep dive into um, something known as the BYAF technique, the but you are free technique. So there's been a lot written about this, but basically you can ask someone to do something. And then if you follow that up by saying, but you are free or words to that effect, but it's up to you, but the choice is yours. Um, it makes people, it can make people up to twice as likely to do what you're asking them to do. And I thought, wow, that is phenomenal. You know, we can start, and it's a little counterintuitive when you think about it, but we can start using that in our marketing. So I, I really started to love this idea of autonomy bias and look for ways that I could inject it into uh, work that I was doing for my clients. And then as I was writing the book, it dawned on me that, um, I don't know, back in the 80s or 90s, a creative director that I was working for actually used autonomy bias in such an incredible way. Uh, we had been working for AT&T at the time, and this was when the breakup happened. And it, you know, it used to be like AT&T was the game in town, and that was it. And it was a, it was a monopoly. And then Judge Green came along and, and broke things up. And of course, AT&T wanted to retain as much of their customer base as they could, but people had to choose: Do I want to stay? Do I want to go? Do I want to you know try someone else? So we were writing all of these direct mail packages, trying to get people to stick with AT&T. And one day my creative director, Frank Parrish, comes in and he's so happy because he has finally, you know, cracked the nut on the lead for his letter. And it was something like, you have to make a decision very soon. And if you don't, someone will make one for you. And this was a, a B2B thing. It was going to uh, business customers of AT&T. And the piece got like a 38.6% response rate. It was phenomenal. It did really, really well. And I, I started to think about that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, all those years ago, you know, I'm sure he wasn't thinking, oh, I need to use autonomy bias, you know, but, but he, he kind of zeroed in on that basic truth that, you know, what business owner, big or small, would want to be told, this is what you're going to do. You know, we've made the choice for you. So when it was framed, I guess, in that way, you know, like you've got to make a choice. And if you don't, someone else is going to make it for you. That's what got people to, to actually respond, you know, when before they've been ignoring the messages and putting them off to the side and, and not really bothering. So, these days, I'm really high on autonomy bias. It's become one of my uh, one of my favorite behavioral science principles. Fun, yeah. It doesn't have an episode of the Brainy Business yet, so uh, we'll uh, put it in the to make an episode on list that, which I'm sure you can appreciate, grows longer every single day because I get excited about so many things. <laughs> I can I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Although I will tell you, I I did use autonomy bias in addition to Frank doing it so many years ago. I did it relatively recently with a cable service. And um, 
you know, how people have, you know, cable TV and you know, it was satellite TV actually, but it was the idea that, you know, you're paying for all these channels you never listen to or never watch, right? And people are tired of that. So they zeroed in on that and they created a, a much different kind of a program where you could start with a basic foundation and then you could customize your channel lineup. And I was like, oh, this is all about autonomy vibes. And we had a 52% increase over the, uh, the control based on that. So uh, not only did it work all those years ago for telecom, it's, it's working for satellite TV now. <laughs> Right. Well, and I hope everyone who's listening, you know, where we end up with a decent amount of people that are in that marketing space that end up being guests on the show, partially because those are the the books that are being written right now or the research that's being done, partially because of my background in that space, you know, who who I end up seeing and, and whatnot. But I, you know, it's not just for marketing, right? These are things, and you know, with my second book being about change management and employee interactions and any sort of, there's applicability across so much more than just creating an advertisement for what it is that you're talking about. And, you know, as I say on that change management side, you don't need money to be exchanging hands. You still are needing someone to buy in on whatever idea you're selling them, whether it's getting, you know, your three-year-old to brush their teeth or... It's, uh, you know, getting extra budget for the coming year, right? It's, it's all that same sort of principle. Yeah, oh, you're absolutely right. And, and we do. We see behavioral science being used in education. We see it in politics. We see it in healthcare. Um, there was the, um, research that came out. It was, it was, I think it was Katie Milkman and, and some other researchers about, um, getting people to get vaccines. And I think they did the research before COVID hit, but uh, it was about trying to get people to get a vaccine, you know, to, to help their health. And I, I think the, out of everything they tested, the winning um, phrase was, you know, we have a vaccine reserved for you or, you know, your vaccine is waiting. But, um, but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I love marketing, but there are other arguably more noble professions where behavioral science can be um, absolutely impactful. Um, and just, you know, just negotiating with people, like you said, whether it's your, your boss or your, uh, your employee or your three-year-old or your spouse, you know, it is important. Absolutely. And yes, that was uh, Katie Milkman and some of the research that was done out of the Behavior Change for Good initiative at Wharton. I will link to both my interview with Katie and that particular research paper on vaccines, which I believe was done. And I'll correct in at the end if I'm wrong here, but I believe they partnered with Walmart and were working on flu vaccines and getting that to increase. And it published during the pandemic, of course, very timely because vaccines became a whole new conversation <laughs> uh, and and taking that insight from that. But amazing and wonderful work uh, out of the Behavior Change for Good initiative, for sure. And we will definitely be linking to that in the show notes for everyone to learn a little bit about that. So what's another concept? Now you get a, you get a, another story, another thing that you're interested in, uh, you know, something, if you have anything, I always love examples where you can say something along the lines of X client came to me and they had this problem, or at least they thought that was the problem. And then we helped them to see that this was really the problem and this is what we did and this is what happened. So if anything like that comes to mind, you know, those are always, I think the most interesting ones for people where they're able to see themselves in those sorts of examples. And if you don't have one that perfectly feels like it fits in there and there's some other story that's just hanging out in your brain, share that one. Whatever it is, the audience will love to hear it. And so will I. <laughs> well, that is, it's a good question. Um, I'm trying to, I think I will go back to the client with the voluntary benefits and they, you know, they're trying to get people to go to these meetings at uh, their company, their employer, uh, where they could learn about the various insurance policies that they could purchase and then purchase one if, if that's what they wanted. So they thought that, you know, we, we need to get um, more people to the meetings. And so we need to do a better job of describing the meetings. We need to do a better job of explaining the benefits. We need to do a better job of, you know, making these meetings, you know, engaging or, or fun. And so they were, you know, running through all these different ways that they could, you know, entice more people to come to the, to the meeting. And what we ended up doing is we, we employed a little bit of choice architecture. So instead of just, you know, sending out that email saying, you know, this is why you should be there, please book your appointment, you know, put it on your calendar, you know, sign up now. Instead of doing that, we, we flipped things around and we told them, we're like, Hey, 
you know, Melina, uh, this is so important that we've scheduled your meeting for you. And it's on this date at this time. And uh, just, you know, click here to get it into your calendar. And then, of course, a little bit further down, there was a link that said, oh, I need to, you know, click here if you need to reschedule. Well, you can pick a different date. But that delivered a 418% increase in attendance. So it wasn't about making the, you know, the meeting sound more relevant or more interesting or, you know, about convincing people, you know, why they should go. It was just changing the default instead of, you know, the, the onus being on the employee to say, yes, I've got to sign up for this meeting. I got to make sure that I go. We just made it easy. So the, the path of least resistance was to accept the meeting. And it was actually more difficult to, to get out of it, to say, oh, no, I don't want to go. I'm going to reschedule it. You know, so we, we just made the default, the thing that we wanted people to do. And, uh, and that was the way we solved the problem. So the problem wasn't, you know, let's make it more interesting to go to a meeting. It was just, let's make it easier to go to the meeting. So I think maybe, maybe that would, uh, would answer your question. I hope so. Oh, yeah. No, I love that example. And it is, uh, I had already made a note that I wanted to link to the episode on sludge. And so in this case, removing some sludge to make it, like you said, easier where and there's an episode on defaults, too. So that'll be in there. But being able to make it so again, it's it's harder to do anything else like that you when you become the status quo it makes it to where you're much more likely to have people just sort of fall in line and do the thing i forget if it was a dan Ariely example or from somewhere else but i know someone in one of these many books <laughs> has an example that they're talking about how they were part of a blood drive and trying to get people on campus to sign up and go donate blood and the author was actually on the team of people that was recruiting people and they themselves had not even gone to go and do the blood drive yet. And part of it was they didn't actually know the room where, like where it was on campus and sort of had heard about it, but didn't know. And then had said, you know, someone came into the office and said, Oh, I'm on my way over there now. Do you want to come with me? And then you can see where it is and whatever. And so having the person to alleviate that pressure walk over with you, it's harder to say no in that aspect. And now you've been and it's easier, you know, for the next sort of time. So that example came to mind. And if that wasn't Dan, if that was you, someone else who's listening or you know who it was, let me know. <laughs> and we'll remember. I it's an example I read years ago, so I don't fully remember where it came from, but thought it, it stuck with me, right? <laughs> yeah, no, I hadn't heard that one, but that's what I love about your podcast. I always learn something new, so that's good. <laughs> awesome. Well, I love that. And hopefully, I'm sure, actually, I won't even say hopefully, I am sure that everyone listening got lots of new knowledge in hearing you talk about your work and your new book and would love if you can share for them, for everyone who is now so excited to go get their own copy of Using Behavioral Science in Marketing and wanting to learn more about you and to connect, what are their best routes to do that? Sure. Thank you for asking. Um, so again, my name is Nancy Harhut and the book is uh, Using Behavioral Science and Marketing, Drive Customer Action and Loyalty by Prompting Instinctive Responses. It is available at Kogan Page as well as uh, on Amazon, Target, Barnes and Noble. And of course, I would love to hear from people, you know, whether or not you want to buy the book, I would just love to hear from people, all of your listeners. So you can reach me, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at at nharhut. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me on Facebook. And uh, you can also visit the website of the agency that I co-founded, HBT Marketing. We're at hbtmktg.com. And um, we've got uh, lots of uh, interviews and articles and podcasts about behavioral science and marketing there that, uh, that people are welcome to peruse. So uh, we'd love to hear from anybody. Fantastic. Yes. And so everyone, please do I always love to give a little bit of, you know, Twitter love to our guests. So you have their at N Harhut, H A R H U T, and tag me as well at the brainy biz, B I Z. Let us know what tidbit stuck out for you the most. What's maybe an action you're going to take, even just to say, thanks, Nancy. That was nice. <laughs> I've never known anyone who creates any sort of content, putting things out into the world. It takes a lot to write a book and it is a scary process where you're just waiting for the world to shun you and <laughs> waiting for that, the, the other, you know, shoe to fall in the world. So having people out there to say, I appreciate you and you're doing good work is 
I, I've never known anyone to say, I don't like that. Right. So <laughs> it's always a good thing. So please do give a shout out. And then again, Nancy, thank you so much for joining me on the show and congratulations again on your first book. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you again to Nancy Harhut for joining me on the show today. What got your brain buzzing in today's conversation? For me, I always enjoy looking at brain science and communication, knowing that while marketing is part of my own roots as well, it isn't the only way we communicate with other people, especially in businesses. You're constantly communicating with people, and there are small tweaks to your messaging that can make all the difference, whether that's in an advertising campaign or an email to your boss or a Slack message to a coworker or an offhanded comment to one of your employees. Properly applied behavioral science can help in all of it. Of course, you get lots of insights on all that from me here on the podcast. And I must admit, I'm a little preoccupied with the change management stuff right now since my own new book, What Your Employees Need and Can't Tell You, is coming out in just a few short weeks, October 11th, 2022. So I'm all in promote mode. (laughs) And I can definitely say that if you enjoyed my first book, What Your Customer Wants and Can't Tell You, you are going to get a lot of value and enjoyment from Nancy's book as well. She does a great job of using relatable examples in short chapters that are easy to apply and giving the reader clear steps for how they can use that tactic or utilize that concept in their own work instead of it just living and dying in a very specific example. So definitely check out Nancy's new book, Using Behavioral Science in Marketing, and give us both a shout out on the socials when you do. And if you enjoyed the episode and want to share a little tidbit that stood out to you, any of that, we always, always love hearing from people and it helps the content creation feel worth it, especially in these early days of a book like Nancy is in. This is a time where, at least in my experience and many of the authors I've spoken to over the years, it can feel really vulnerable. So it's so appreciated when people say they got value from any of the content. Nancy is at N Harhut on Twitter. That's N H A R H U T. And I'm the Brainy Biz, B I Z. Come find us and shout us out there. And of course, there are links to those connections. So you can make sure you're going to the right place, as well as ways to get in touch with Nancy to get your own copy of her book and my own and to check out past episodes and other related books. So much. It's all waiting for you in the show notes, which are in the app you're listening to and at the brainybusiness.com slash 219. And if you enjoy the experience I've provided here for you, will you share about it? That could mean leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen, sharing this episode or any other with a friend who you think would find value in the insights, or even hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Thank you so much in advance. I appreciate it and you. Thank you again to Nancy Harhut for joining me on the show today. It was a delight to chat with and learn from you. Join me next week for another brainy episode of the Brainy Business Podcast. It's going to be a lot of fun. You won't want to miss it. Until then, thanks again for listening and learning with me. And remember to be thoughtful. Thank you for listening to the Brainy Business Podcast. Melina offers virtual strategy sessions, workshops, and other services to help businesses be more brain-friendly. For more free resources, visit thebrainybusiness.com.